Tell Me What to Read is recorded on the lands of the Wongal people, and we pay our respects to all elders past and present, and extend our welcome to any First Nations people listening today. This is Tell Me What to Read, brought to you by Booktopia. I'm your host, Nick Wasiliev, and welcome to the show where we chat about the next great books you should be reading with the authors behind them and familiar faces who read them. All books mentioned in today's show can be found right now at booktopia.com.au, and the links can be found in the description. Before we officially start, I want to acknowledge that we are all tuning in from stolen country. Um, I'm on unceded Yagra and Turrbal land, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present, um, and just to acknowledge any First Nations folks who are listening today, and elders on all the lands that we're tuning in from. Um, What country are you on, Tom? Uh, I'm in uh, the Kulin Nation, Wondry and Bunurong people, and yes, I'd like to join you in paying those respects and apologise profusely to all involved for me <laughs> being a very cool millennial who's tied into technology <laughs> <laughs> and appropriately acted like a boomer trying to join this space. Sorry, everyone. Very telling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I imagine probably a few folks who are tuning in don't know who I am, um, but my name's Emerald. I am from Manjin, Brisbane. I post political hot takes on the internet. I was once a Greens candidate and I do the Serious Danger podcast with Tom. And you didn't win, is that right? When you were I candidate? didn't. I lost, humiliatingly. Right. I uh, was defeated by one Andrew Lamming, so, you know, it says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the lowest of the low. Exactly, yeah. Um, we Tom, I asked before if anyone had pre-ordered your book and we got one like from... Hannah, who has the little like frog <laughs> thing, so I'm really sorry. Hopefully, this goes well enough, and maybe people will pre-order it after this chat. No one reads books anymore. Everyone's <laughs> all over it. It's dying, just like Twitter. Yeah, oh, hang on. I'm not supposed to say that. Is that um, look? It, the, the pre-order demand is through the roof. So they probably tried to pre-order and just oh, like, I see. failed, and there was just oh, none no. left. So I think that's probably what it is. Yeah. The sad reaction from Booktopia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Josh in Booktopia. You know I love you. You're so fine. sad. Um, it's I, I saw that Booktopia has recommended it as part of their like Christmas gift guide. Um, mm, I don't know. Like, have mm. they have they read it? Like, do they know? It? It's pretty much. It's like the you know. It's the Communist Manifesto for millennials. Right. So. It is a bit of a downer. I've, I've been trying to sell it to people and sort of say, you know, it is fun. There's lots of swear words. There's funny pictures of me as a kid. Um, That's true. There's some funny graphs and visuals and funny stories, but um, ultimately the world is pretty depressing. The state <laughs> of the world, particularly for millennials who, you know, we're not going to be dead for ages. It is pretty bleak. So I I don't know if it is a great Christmas upper uh, <laughs> necessarily, but I guess I guess people I mean, will find out. It's more than that, right? Like maybe, maybe like off the top, what? How would you summarize the book? Thirty to to sixty seconds. What's it about? What's the go? Oh boy! It is my attempt to comprehensively sum up the raw deal that our generation has received, uh, and explain why things got so shitty for us as a generation. I think people are very familiar with the boomer versus millennial griping. We're whinging. We're eating smashed avocado. We're always complaining <laughs> and uh, posting our L's. And I guess I was hoping to investigate and summarise exactly why that is the case when it comes to six main areas, work, housing, education, privatisation, wealth inequality and the climate crisis and try and explain and make, you know, make it very clear to people that you're not crazy, you're not just self-entitled, you're not idiots. Something went really, really wrong about 50 mm. years ago that means things are so bleak right now. And while, you know, obviously this book will start the revolution and fix all those problems, ultimately the first step to doing anything politically useful, I think, or thinking about the world in a useful way is to to try and understand what exactly went wrong, how it all went to shit in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a pretty fucking ambitious book. Like, did did you know it was going to be this? 
when you started? Did you set out and be like, I'm going to write a book about everything? <laughs> no, and I really should have should have done that. It's a terrible decision. No, look, the book originally, st- I mean, the, the, the ideas in the book, My Political Evolution and Education, has been bubbling away in the background since like 2015, 2016. When Trump got elected, I started to ask questions about how everything works and started to think, hang on, I don't understand anything here. So I started on a little journey that has ended me up at whatever I am now, which is a you know left-wing populist, democratic socialist guy. But I'm also a comedian, so I've been trying to write jokes about that and trying to learn about that. And so that sort of been, has been going on for a while. But the book deal was sort of signed in 2020 when the world was going to shit in the midst of COVID. And I guess you know, knowing that I was going to be trapped inside for quite a while, <laughs> I thought that I'd spend that time to try and as best as I can sum up what I'd learned over the past five or six years. And yes, initially, originally it was going to be like, I think there were 12 chapters originally. Every second chapter was going to be a summary of like my life from a certain period. So like the first chapter was 1989 to 1999, then, you know, three year um, uh, steps, you know, dispersed in between all the other chapters. And then that went went for way too long. And I needed to cut, (laughs) cut all my boring life shit out and just focus on my incredible political analysis of the state of the world. It's, I, this is so, I haven't finished it yet, as you know. Sorry. I've got Emerald. So no spoilers, no spoilers. Um, but, like, when I have been telling people that I'm reading it or talking to people about it and they say, is it good? And I have to say, unfortunately, yes, it's very <laughs> good. I have to admit, like, it. it's very, um, it puts things in a really easy to understand way while somehow still managing to get a lot of nuance in there. Like, it's actually quite quite bloody impressive. Just for the listeners, point of view, this pains Emerald because to express any kind of sincere emotion, <laughs> to compliment me as a friend, as a comrade, brings her pain and discomfort. It does. And then she was not hoping for that at all. So that's why it's bad for her, but great for the reader. It's true. I want to know, like... Where did you get all these facts? Like, there, <laughs> I <laughs> just made them up. You know, like, what's the research process? Because there, what I think is perhaps one of the most enjoyable parts of the book for me are that it has all these cute little like footnotes and asides, which is very much your kind of style, mm-hmm. but little little quirky tidbits that I have somehow never heard of, despite being someone who unfortunately spends a lot of time thinking and reading and learning about. Australian politics and Australian political history, you'll just come out with these little, like, weird, quirky facts. Where did you find them all? Um, Look, they're all, you know, incredibly well-researched and sourced. I couldn't be bothered doing an index or anything like that because that felt like too much, too much like writing an actual book. But honestly, like, (laughs) anything that was crazy that made you go, oh, my God, I can't believe that's true, I tried to write into the Mm. text, being like, according to, you know, this reputable body, then, you know, this is the fact. I mean... You know, if you if you read enough data or enough history, very for me anyway, very quickly the picture becomes pretty clear anyway. And there is there are some very real observable trends since the nineteen seventies and eighties when it comes to worker power, when it comes to mm. how much house prices have skyrocketed, how much you could just easily very look up how much student debt has ballooned ever since Hex was introduced, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, it's all from very reputable, well-resourced places. The ABS, <laughs> um, uh, the census was a big source as well, um, and official sources wherever I, I could uh, include them. But yeah, I'm really smart, and well-read. Yeah, apparently. I mean, I was a little what it says. What your like your week is ATAR, but it's not an ATAR for you. Like your year twelve score thing was some. It was like a ninety nine percent. That almost Not- that just made me resent you a little bit. <laughs> Maybe you should take That's, that out. It's a funny photo. This is from the education section when um, I, uh, I included that, yes, I got an enter score of 99.80 without doing any maths Ooh. or science, I should say. And the local paper got me to take a photo with the text you get when they send the results. So I'm there oh, with yeah, my it's a great Nokia 3210, um, or my, my, my Motorola, rather. It's a photo <laughs> of my brother with his Nokia 3210 uh, displaying our year 12 results. We were very, very cool. Really cool. Yeah. Really, very, very cool. Um, and, like, clearly it's been 
this has been something that you were destined to do. There's the section, one another part that I really like is when you're recounting going on a family holiday and it's got little excerpts from Tom's diary mm-hmm. as a sort of like five-year-old uh, like documenting this family holiday and it's in that kind of when you first start writing and mm-hmm. you have to have literal translation translations <laughs> for what you're trying to say and things are beautiful uh but yeah even little baby writer tom it's compelling stuff well thank you very much yes obviously <laughs> i've been planning this book for a very long time uh you will see extracts of the diary in the book if you're so interested some beautiful drawings of the great barrier reef are in there as well um, oh yeah some photos that I found a lot of photos in there, including one of me uh, climbing Uluru, um, which is cancelable material, but it was the nineties. So it was there, a different yeah. time, you know. You know. Uh, yes. but yes, that's been a fun that was a fun bit. I was like, oh, what can I make do to make this book a little bit different? And yeah, including in photos or weird pictures and bits and personal bits and pieces. That was sort of I think helped well, it took up a lot of space as well, which also worked. Yeah. And you were telling me that actually when you were at letterboxing for the greens that someone in you know this week recognized you and was like tv's tom ballard is this what you're doing now (laughs) Um, but i i guess like for some people it is maybe confusing or unexpected that you would go from you know doing comedy to being so heavily involved in politics and then writing a book that is very much takes a clear you know political standpoint but you intersperse it with comedy and humor in an interesting way and similar like yeah how you've got you've got little kind of comic relief you've got photos of yourself and one good example of this as well how you try to make things less depressing by just breaking it up with cute bits is the climate change chapter where you're just like recounting facts about how fucked our environment is with cute little (laughs) animal facts (laughs) You like that bit? Yeah, I'm, I'm can I, writing that too. Like, can I read, like, one example of how this goes? I won't read yeah. all of it. No, please. But it's like, for example, in, in little text, according to the World Wildlife Fund, humanity has wiped out 60% of mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles since 1970. And then in bigger text, it says, squirrels have been known to take in orphaned pups if the babies are closely related to the adoptive mother. Oh, It's cute. I like it. A group of ferrets is called a business. Oh, I really like that as well. Yeah. I think that's just silly, but it's silly <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> These are fun facts. I mean, yeah, I guess, look, for whatever USP I have, for any unique skill I could have that contribute to this conversation that might be of some use is hopefully, yes, making the world of politics and what's happening in the world less impenetrable and less boring for people. Because, yeah, if you read a bunch of academia or you know, think tank reports on stuff, which can be fun, I guess, when you learn a little bit, but it can all just seem way too hard and complicated. Mm. And as you and I have discussed on Serious Danger many times, Emerald, when you get down to it, sometimes it's actually not as complicated at all. And sometimes the people in power and who run politics make us want to think it's all very complicated. But fundamentally, most people can get their head around the idea that rich people run our society and are screwing us all over. And 40 years of that being the way it is and introducing markets into almost every factor of life has produced the society we live in today with massive inequality and nothing seems to work and everyone's unhappy. So, you know, when, when you boil it down to that simple stuff and express it in a way that connects with people, then that's that's kind of fun. Yeah, it's definitely – it's even, even though, you know, obviously not all of this stuff or a lot of this stuff isn't new. Like we've heard it before in various places but I do think that bringing it all together in one place like you have kind of this snapshot of what it's like to live in Australia as a young person in this current moment Uh um, that is helpful and it is helpful to to yeah get just like this little package that explains why everything's so shit in a way that totally makes sense Uh, (laughs) but it doesn't feel awful to read (laughs) (laughs) thank you (laughs) Yeah, I'll be nice. All right, I don't want to. I have to say something. It doesn't mean. feel awful to read. Everyone's <laughs> Why didn't you? Why didn't you consult me for a blurb? Now I'm wondering. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, do you have, like, do you have a favorite chapter? Um, the bit that I'm actually like really proud of or I enjoyed writing is the epilogue, which you might not be up to yet, which is ironic. No. But up. Uh, <laughs> 
the epilogue, so yeah, basically the, the structure of the book is a prologue and then these sort of six long essays on those areas I mentioned before work essays. out. Essays. They're essays well, now, just chapters. Essay chapter things, whatever the hell. <laughs> I should probably know the answer to that. Um, uh, privatisation, wealth, inequality and, and climate change. And then the epilogue is trying to hopefully sum it up. Now, spoiler alert, throughout the whole book, I avoid using the word neoliberalism because I'm trying to, I think, show what that is. Mm. which might be a term that lots of people are either kind of familiar with or, or heard as a sort of a buzzword term. And then in the epilogue, I try and, you know, I say, okay, what are we actually talking about here? This, this phenomenon, this age of capitalism that we've lived in since, lived in since the 70s, the world, the version of capitalism that our generation has inherited is called this, this, this thing called neoliberalism. And then trying to sum that up, I suppose, as to what that really means in both sort of fancy political science terms, but also emotionally, I suppose, Mm -hmm. because I think for me, it was a real light bulb moment once I started to put all this stuff together myself personally, this, this idea that we live in such a individualized sort of lonely society and and a whole bunch of fronts. And it's sort Mm -hmm. of like things don't necessarily have to be that way. And that is actually a political phenomenon. And this, just this sense that something's not quite right that I think the neoliberal era has really given rise to, which has really made us all feel very alienated and disconnected from each other and the rest of society. So I hope at least the epilogue is some wacky attempt to try and bring all that together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can't wait to read it. (laughs) (laughs) This is why I didn't ask you for a quote. Okay. Because of this Uh, bullshit. Whatever. Um, I think like, yeah, I well, I guess I don't know for sure what my favorite chapter is because I I haven't finished, but I did quite like like a, there's a very spirited chapter against privatization, um, including I don't know if you remember this, but a call to nationalize Twitter, yes. uh, which is you know an interesting <laughs> demand given the current context. <laughs> Do you stand by that? Well, I believe it's to nationalise it and then shut it down to make us all go outside. I yeah, but... It was quite something like that, yes. But, Tom, how are we going to pay for it? Well, that's a very good, very it good was, question. How much did Elon Musk pay for Twitter? 44 bill. <laughs> well, how much did tax costs? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, we can buy Twitter. With it. If we reverse stage we three... Can, <laughs> oh, we, can, we can save Twitter right now, Tom, if we well, just... I, I give it a bit of time. It's getting cheaper every day. Exactly. But, um, yes. Elon himself gets a um, gets a mention in the wealth inequality chapter. The inequality. I do run through oh, yeah. some some rich. Maybe we we won't use the c word in this particular context, but a very rude word to respond to the richest of the rich. And uh, Elon gets a little look in there. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Elon. Um, you didn't go too much into Elon's like history of how his father or you know his father owning that that emerald mine don't know what's going on there but (laughs) we shouldn't say that because we'll get shut down (laughs) yes i'm sure this is a parody we should make that clear oh yeah parody that's right that's right parody (laughs) um is it uh, when as you were writing the book like we so you you said you started writing it properly kind of in 2020 is that right Mm mm-hmm And then we started Serious Danger last year, almost exactly one year ago, actually. Um, And there would be many times where you would appear a little stressed. (laughs) Um, And I I mean, yeah, can you speak a little bit to like what the writing process was like? And I feel like the answer is yes. But were there moments where you were like, I guess the book isn't happening? Yes. There definitely, there definitely was. I really, you know, looking over it now, I, I'm convinced that the book is not as painful to read as it was to write. So that's good news <laughs> for everyone who wants to make a, make a pre-order now. I think talking to other people who've written books, I think writing a book is hard. I think writing mm-hmm. your first book is really hard. I think writing a book uh, to solve and explain everything during a pandemic <laughs> is particularly hard. And also, you know, as a lazy comedian, I'm not used to actual work so all those factors combining together produced a very challenging adventure that <laughs> that's I nice can't ex- it. it's nice isn't it I can't express to you how delighted I am that it's over but I'm also <laughs> proud of it and would like other people to read it mm. but yes I mean particularly during the second lockdown last year in Melbourne that was particularly bleak 
And even though the most infuriating thing being, even though I had literally nothing else on and nothing at all to do all day but sit down and write my book, there were moments in which I said, I simply cannot do this today, mm-hmm. okay? I don't, I have no spoons. This is emotional labor. And I can't <laughs> do it. And I so we did, we did need to push back to release date. <laughs> I don't know what that fun. is. Um, and, then, and originally the book was much more responsive to COVID. So every chapter started with a look at how something like, you know, labor relations or privatization played out in the pandemic. That was sort of the opening to each chapter was looking at how everything went to shit mm. during the pandemic, which, you know, is still quite interesting. And there's a bit of reflection on what the pandemic meant for the political economy in the book. But um, yeah, it was, it really did seem to be the peak and the worst of the pandemic in 2020. You know, we were all looking at the way these, this entire society, which is based around markets and everything set up to make a profit, you know, a pandemic comes along, throws all that into shit and capitalism starts losing its mind. So mm. that was interesting. I remember how everything was going to change after the pandemic and everything was yeah. going to be radi- well, radically different. <laughs> that's right. Things were going to, yeah, we were going to radically transform, you know, our society and our economy and we were going to bake bread for everyone um, and tax the rich and, and, well, or just kill the rich with the virus. Yes. Yeah, what so, yeah, it didn't really work out. I mean, I'm curious, like, there are so many things in the book like that are very very current like I wonder how you feel about the fact that it maybe I guess the basic concepts won't be out of date in a few years but it talks about like specific campaigns that are happening right now to prevent fracking for example or like decisions before parliament around like the stage three tax cuts like Mm. what what was your reasoning for having it be such a like a a moment in time was that a fairly deliberate decision i think i think so i mean i will say i was a little bit worried when labor was thinking about um not going ahead with the stage three tax cuts (laughs) i was like i've already sent the book to the printer and i hang a lot of shit on them for that then thank (laughs) god the australian labor party came through for us and and Mm. doubled down you privately lobbied them yeah oh booktopia (laughs) was behind the scenes like (laughs) guys look at this book um and and I will say, again, when the book was much more COVID heavy, that was crazy, like writing it and something would happen every day that was oh, yeah. another wacky spin on our re- response to COVID or what COVID was doing to our society and, and what it meant. Um, so that was, that was pretty wild. And getting to that point where I was like, okay, I need to actually just sort of step back a little bit and look at the big picture and tell the bigger history that's, you know, and, and not stress about giving every single detail of political manoeuvres over the past decade. Um, but, it, I mean, it's crazy. Once you learn about trickle-down economics, okay, and this, this idea, this theory that was come up on the back of a napkin uh, by Arthur yes. Laffer in, 19, in the 1970s, okay, and his little Laffer curve there, the idea that, you know, taxes need to be set at a certain level to inspire. Mm. And um, no one's laughing trying. now. Right, Tom? What? Who's laughing now? I don't know what you mean. Who's Is laughing that... now? No, well, well, you're so- it, it, well, yeah, you're saying that word incorrectly, so I'm not sure what what that is. Maybe that's a, is that a Twitter Spaces thing? I'm oh, sorry, that's not something. Correct. Yeah, yeah, you were, yeah. Took you ten minutes to look. <laughs> Maybe it'll take you ten minutes to get the joke. That's Thanks for the laugh, reacts, Kayla and D. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, once you learn that, once you learn that's the theory, you know, cut taxes that will spur economic growth. This bullshit lie that has never worked wherever it's been tried but of course works out great for the rich and for the ruling class once you recognize that in the 70s then you just see it everywhere it is so it it was yeah Mm. tried under under the uh, under reagan of course and under thatcher under bush in the early 2000s massive tax cuts um we had the um big push for the cut to the corporate tax rate as well under turnbull and labor signed up to it and then of course trump does his big tax cuts and now they're trying to do it again and Liz Trust just tried to do it and it made <laughs> England explode. Um, so once you get those sort of big, you know, I was trying to like explain the big political economic ideas of the neoliberal era and then you can see yeah. them being rolled out again and again and again in lots of different um, places at different times. So it, I, I don't know. I, I, I would bet a lot of money on the fact that uh, right-wing conservatives and rich people are going to try and do trickle-down economics a, a few more times before it's officially you know, consigned to the dustbin of history. Yeah, unfortunately, you would probably win that bet, I would say. Um, 
Look, we should probably wrap up soon. We ran a little bit over, I think, Amy, for about half an hour. But there was one, I, I saw one reply, which Kayla is, is asking when the audiobook is going to be available because I know that you have, you recorded it, right? Did indeed, yes. Did the whole writing thing. Was almost losing my voice when we started. So that was great. But uh, <laughs> they'll fix all that in post, I'm sure. Um, there will be an audiobook. I read the entire thing. It was great fun. And that's going to be released on the same day, on November 30th, when the book's out in stores. I be- You can pre-order the audiobook now too. That's totally fine. Cute. Okay. Um, and we're doing... I, I mean, I'd order both, Emerald. I would get the audiobook and then you can listen to me read it out to you and you can also... While I'm reading. Pictures. Yeah, I think that no, makes sense. No, yeah. Yeah, well, I get to listen to you talk enough, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I ask you to do this? You just got to roast me at all these events, right? I don't know. We still have to do another one. You've still got – you're going to have to sit in a room with me oh, God. and have me just talk about how I probably still haven't read your book. No, I promise I'll have read it by the time that we have this in-person launch. Um, do you want to plug – you've got three actual in-person – book events, one in Melbourne, one in Sydney, one in Brisbane coming up? Uh, yes, indeed. Yes. Three three big ones. November the 30th in Melbourne with Osman Faruqi. Um, that's on, yeah, Wednesday, November 30th when it's out in stores. That Friday, the 2nd of December at Better Off Red Than Dead in Sydney in Newtown. Typical. That's me <laughs> talking to Jan Fran. And then the following Tuesday, the 6th of December in Brisbane in Greensland. Greensland. The old museum in conversation with my dear comrade, Emerald Moon. Me. If you're That's around, you. please come talk to us. In any event, please pre-order a copy of I'm Millennial. You can get it from booktopia.com.au. It's in their Christmas gift guide, but you can just find the book. Um, whether you do Christmas or not, you know, we're not allowed to say Christmas anymore. Christmas is cancelled. Yes, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what are you like what is next is there any other stuff that you have got coming up that's kind of on the horizon tom that you want to let everyone know about oh gosh i'll i'll be talking to people about this book for about a year because i i work so okay. hard on it and i need everyone to look at my work and give me a good sticker big so, dog star a plus We'll be launching it then, you know, there's book festivals and stuff next year, which I'll be um, touring around. I will be touring a new stand-up show as well and um, flogging it left, right and centre. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm just really interested to see what, what people make of it and hopefully it, hopefully it obviously has relevance and can G up a bunch of millennials and Zoomers and make us angry at the system. But hopefully my sincere hope is that people of the baby boomer generation might check out the book and might get mm-hmm. an appreciation as to why their kids are yelling at them all the time and why I was so alienated and annoyed. And I hope at the end of it, the book, they know that they're not the enemy just because they're a part mm. of the boomer generation. But in fact, we are all part of the working class, all of us getting screwed over by by the ruling class who were made up of boomers and millennials and just rich people generally of all, of all ages and shapes and sizes. That's the dream. Yes. I think that's a very good point, even though it is called... Even though what the subtitle is like screed against boomers, yeah, well, that's, uh, that's marketing and everything it? else. That'll that'll hook them in. You know, that'll get them angry. It's good. But it is actually a tale of intergenerational solidarity. It is um, a call to action, I think, for people of all ages to you know, and and people of the working class to actually do something to get us out of this fucking neoliberal nightmare. Mm. So, yes, definitely recommend um, get the book. If you want to, can I can I tell people to also listen to Serious Danger? If you want to learn more about Serious Danger. Oh, yeah. Yeah, head to seriousdangerpod.com. We've got socials links. We do weekly episodes. Um, and we'll probably chuck some, some more stuff about Tom's book up there as he is promoting it. But until then... Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Sorry for the the tech difficulties at the start. Um, And, you know, enjoy the last days of Twitter, potentially. (laughs) (laughs) My first and last ever Twitter space. There we go. Yeah. (laughs) No, No, I really appreciate people, yeah, the patience and sticking, hanging in there to listen to it. I want to thank you, Emerald, very much. I want to thank Toby for putting this on. And, uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for taking time out of your day to have a listen to us, have a chat about this little book. I hope, uh, hope people like it. Bye, babies. Bye, babies. Thanks to all of our guests on today's show. 
Remember, all books mentioned in today's show can be found right now at booktopia.com.au. Links can be found in the description. We would also love to hear what you're reading, so feel free to join the conversation on social media. Search Booktopia on your favourite platform and join our book club. We'll catch you for our next episode, but until then, thanks for listening and never stop reading.